Reverse. My black K cat. Chapter 23. Perspicacious. Things have escalated to the point that Hiruza now cringes reflexively every time Kakashi sends him a report. This time is no different, even if the report happens to come with one of Itachi's crows instead of one of Kakashi's ninken. As soon as the bird has deposited its message and swooped back out the window, Hiruzen sits back in his chair, eyeing the scroll wearily. Across the office, at a slightly battered additional desk dragged in for his use, the Kazekage looks up. Something wrong? He asks suspiciously. More than likely, yes. Hiruzen sighs, raising a hand to rub at the forming headache even as he reaches for the message. Deciding it's best to get things over with, he opens it quickly and unrolls it, studying the words. Ah, yes, that's a familiar headache. He's taken too fondly referring to it as Karama! Karama's pursuit team encountered two more Jinchomagi, he tells Rasa grimly, apparently loyal to Karama's cause, as they were willing to start a fight in order to keep the team from following him. Rasa blows out a short, sharp breath and leans back in his chair, shoving a stack of paperwork aside and crossing his arms over his chest. Two, he asks. <laughs> or do you want to bet that your team just found those gentility he was been unforthcoming about? Unlike my former student, he reasons says dryly, I'm not in the habit of taking sucker bets. I believe you're right. Perhaps now Iwo will begin to take us more seriously. Onuki is a hard-headed fool, but even he can be made to see reason virtually. It's all the rocks they bounce their skulls off during training. The Kazekage sounds reluctantly amused. I've never met more stubborn shinobi than the ones from Iwa. You've never come across an Uzumaki! Iruzen almost counters, but stops himself at the last moment. Given the circumstances, it's probably not the most tactful thing he could say. That makes forge and Shuriki at least. Rasa says thoughtfully, making Iruzen glance up at him again. The Kazekage has his chair tipped back, his eyes on the wall, but focused beyond it. Five, if Uzumaki really is one. Six, if Taki's Jinchuriki isn't sulking in the woods somewhere like they seem to think she is. And if he's even managed to convince the older ones to side with him, I'd expect he's already converted Gara and the other boy. Iruzen wonders about that. It's only a suspicion, but he finds it likely that Iwa's two Jinchuriki are missing Nin, or the next best thing. He hasn't heard even vague mentions of them in years, which is rather telling. Iwa isn't shy about otherwise flaunting its strength, and they were noticeably absent in the Third Shinobi War. Perhaps Onaki kept them back because Kushina rarely made an appearance on the battlefield. Hiruzen didn't want to provoke Iwa into mobilizing against her personally, but... Onaki isn't a subtle man. If he'd had the power, he likely would have used it. So it stands to reason that this Han and Roshi had already made themselves absent back then. Those who have suffered longest are often the easiest converts. He reminds Arasa, re-rolling Kakashi's scroll. Especially if Karama is offering them something they've wanted for a long time. With a suddenness that's almost jerky, especially compared to his usual forthright grace, Rasa shoves to his feet, sending his chair sliding back to crash into the wall. He doesn't even glance back as he stalks up to the window where he pauses, bracing one hand on the glass as he looks out over Kanaha's streets. And just what is it he's offering them, Hibuzen? He demands. What could he have offered that would have made five Jinchuriki turn their backs on the world that created them, that revered them? Revered? I would rather say feared, Hibuzen says evenly, leaning back in his seat and reaching for his pipe to give his hands something to do. Rasta, I know very well the state of Suno's relationship with its Jinchuriki. Your relationship with your son, he doesn't say because that's also a little too tactless to utter right now. Do you really imagine that any other village is different? Perhaps it's less overt elsewhere, but Jinchuriki are feared for their capabilities, for the fact that there are the closest things to gods this world has encountered trapped inside of them. Only B is different that I've seen, and he's worked his entire life to be seen as non-threatening. Because he's looking for it, he can see the flicker of grief that crosses Rasa's face, deep and painful, and instantly shut away. For all his many faults, Rasa loved his wife, loves his village, and Arusen is absolutely certain that Rasa loves his youngest son as well. 
But he's a Kage. Before he's a father, something Hiruzen knows all too well. And the Ichibi seal is loose. Cracking. It wasn't meant to be this way, Hiruzen is sure, but it is. Gara is a monster instead of a weapon, and as Kaze Kage, Rasa can do little more than work to contain and control him, even if containing him means ending his life. Rasa is paying for his choices, for his mistakes. A very small part of Iruzin wonders if Minato would have faced the same choices had he used a weaker seal and survived his battle with the Kyubi. Is that all this is? Rasa asks, low and intent. Really? You think Uzumaki has done all of this because he's a kind person? Because he doesn't want to see the other Jinchuriki suffering? I know you can be a fool, Iruzin, but don't be a naive one. There has to be some other motivation. He's correct, and Iruzin inclines his head, allowing for the point. Yes, but I've yet to see any concrete evidence of it. We haven't even been able to predict his path. Rasa hums low in his throat, not looking away from the blue horizon. Does he have ties? Bonds? Do you know anything about his past? It takes several moments of shuffling through the piles on his desk, but Hiruzen finally finds the scroll with Kakashi's first report, right after the recovery of the daimyo's daughter. With it is another report, this one from a team Hiruzen sent to track Karama's movements before he reached Kanaha. Because he knows every word of both, he passes them over to Rasa without hesitation. This isn't a time or situation where any of them can afford to keep secrets. He came from the north, Hiruzen says, sitting back again to light his pipe. A squad tracked his movements to a town near the border where he stayed for the night. The innkeeper was unforthcoming, but one of our regular patrons recognized his description. Before that, there's no record of him anywhere that we've been able to find. Then again, I can't really say I expected anything less. Rasa's eyes flicker up from the scrolls for a moment, and he raises one brow slightly. You think... He starts, and then stops, frowning in consternation. Sorotobi can read the rest of that question in his face. It's not exactly a leap of logic, honestly, given what they know. That he's been in Uzushio since it fell? It's a distinct possibility. But Uzushio didn't have a Jinchuriki. Rasa counters, shifting that frown to Hiruzen. If they had, they wouldn't have been wiped out by Kiri. Hiruzen ums and lets himself play devil's advocate just for the touch it puts in Rasa's expression. Kiri has a respectable population and a decent force. There are also several times the size Uzushio was. With a scalp, Rasa drops the reports on the desk and crosses his arms over his chest. Kiri also has an overabundance of bloodthirsty bastards who are more interested in killing each other than taking their wongmongering to another country. If Uzushio had been hit by anything but a surprise attack, by anything, by anyone but the Saidami Mizukage and the Seven Swordsmen, they'd have sent Kiri running. As it is, there was no Jinjuriki there. There was no shaving, Yuzushio. Your logic is flawed. Is it? Hiruzen asks mildly. These are our suppositions. Uzumaki Kurama is Uzumaki Kushina's younger half-brother by the same father, literally bred to be a Jinchuriki, likely by Kumo. One of nine brothers, if his stories are to be believed. I would assume he grew up hearing of his home, the wonders of Yuzushio, and the first chance he got to escape, he ran there early enough that he encountered his half-sister but never told her of his identity or the beast he carried within him. Kushina left to take on the Kyubi, and barely a month later, Uzushio fell. Perhaps Kurama was not in the village. Perhaps he was. Either way, a young boy was left in the shattered remains of the only home he'd ever known, his family dead or out of reach. All he had was his home, broken as it was, and the biju inside of him. There's a long minute of silence. Rasa is staring at him, thoughts flickering quickly across his face, though he doesn't voice them. Iruzin sighs softly, taking a drag on his pipe. Kurama is grieving, even now, he says. It was as plain as day when I met him. If the grief is still so fresh, twenty-five years after Uzushio's fall, he has to have kept its memory close to him somehow. All of Uzushio's remaining shinobi scattered afterwards, what few of them were left, but... What if Kurama didn't? That's a long time to live alone. Rasa agrees after another moment, voice faintly rough. Not alone. Hiruzen gives him a humorless smile. That's the point, isn't it? 
25 years listening to the Buju in his head, believing that had he had a little more power, a little more control, he could have saved his home. Well, this is only speculation, of course. Speculation that makes an unfortunate amount of sense. Rasa leans against the edge of the desk, weariness briefly overcoming propriety, and rubs a hand over his eyes. Neither of them have gotten more than a few hours of sleep in the past few days, and the hours are starting to drag like lead weights. He's saving them, at least in his own mind. Who went for the youngest first, from what we could tell? Ibuzen agrees. Forgive the application, but any other child treated the same way as Gawa and Naruto would be considered the worst kind of abuse. So we took them. It's likely he has a plan as to what he'll do with them when he's collected all eight of the others. He's too smart not to, but we've no way of knowing what it is. Revenge? Rasa suggests, mouth pulling into an unhappy line. For the oppression, or however he wants to freeze it. Maybe. Karama certainly seemed prone to anger, but... If his temper is anything like Krishina's, it's the type of anger that fades quickly. Though, really, at this point, Iruzen will believe practically anything when Kurama is concerned. The one man, even a Jinchuriki, could cause so very many problems is... improbable! Before he can say as much, though, there's a sharp, urgent rap. Not on the door of the office, but on the window, and both Kage turn quickly. Iruzen blinks in surprise, pulling his pipe away from his mouth at the sight of Hagane Kotetsu clinging to the sill, looking serious. The boy is a jokester, light-hearted, and prone to laughter, but he takes authority seriously. For him to skip the main door in favor of the window, something must have happened. Kotetsu? Iruzen asks, throwing open the window and allowing the chunin to eel his way through the wind arrow gap. I thought you were on gate duty this morning. The boy, who frequently runs messages for him, belatedly bows to both men and then blurts, The Rikongi is at the gates, sir! Iruzen! Stares at him for a long moment, then closes his eyes and pinches the bridge of his nose. Of course he is. He mutters and then raises his voice again. With Shinobi. A pair of bodyguards and his brother, Katetsu reports. It only takes a second to calculate distances and times involved. There's little chance that A was able to get his message before he departed unless he recently learned the flying thunder gun technique. And Ibuzen hopes for all their sakes that he hasn't. Therefore, this can't be about the warning Hiruzen sent about Karama, but he can't think of a single other thing that would motivate A to come so deeply into enemy territory with his brother, Kunmo's most well-known Jinteriki. More things wrong, undoubtedly. Rasa's voice is wry. Hiruzen snorts. Maybe he and the Kazakage are only reluctant allies, bound by treaties and defeats and circumstance. But when he glances at the auburn-haired man, their eyes meet in a moment of perfect shared understanding. Who did you leave at the gate, then? He asks Kotetsu, tapping out his pipe with only a flicker of regret. I assume you didn't simply abandon your post. Of course not, Okage-sama! Katatsu looks offended by the very idea. Kenma was waiting for his team anyway, so he said he'd keep an eye on things. He was in both to his feet fast enough that his bones protest and he accidentally knocks his chair over. <gasps> you left Ganma! He echoes disbelievingly, hurrying around the side of his desk. He doesn't bother berating Katatsu and heads for the door with a more haste than he's used since he first heard that Kakashi and Karama were fighting over Naruto! A moment later, Rasa appears on his left, keeping pace with him. This Genma's a hothead, he asks with faint amusement. It would be easier for everyone if he were. Instead, Genma is the type of cool-headed that lets him think every action through, work out all the angles, and then still do things that are reckless enough to give Hiruzen even more gray hairs. Hiruzen blames Kushina's influence. Genma might have been Minato's bodyguard, but the boy practically worshipped Kushina as his patron goddess. No, he answers as they hit the street and just manages to catch a flash of his current bodyguard's worried expression despite how he's trying to stay unseen. Raido knows better than anyone why Genma shouldn't be left alone around A. I'm afraid Kumo Nin were responsible for the deaths of his mother and older sister, the last of his family. I don't doubt that A can survive almost anything, but Genma is not urban, but he needs to be. Rasa winces. Clearly familiar with Sachigaj's understandable given the state of Kumo's relations with Suna. 
Then again, Kumo doesn't really have peaceable relations with any of the other villages. He is a paranoid bastard at the best of times. Thankfully, the gate is just around the next corner, and Haruzin slows to a brisk walk, tugging his robes back into place. There's no sound of distraction from up ahead, though that means little. Genma is one of Anbu's best assassins for a reason, and it's not because he's flashy. Still, Haruzin takes it as a good sign and rounds the corner with the majority of his composure intact. It's not quite as bad as he was expecting. Genma is lounging back against the side of the gatehouse, Senban between his teeth, expression lazy and amused. A is eyeing him suspiciously from just outside the gate, and the Reikage's bodyguards are visibly tense. Hiruzen, who knows Genma well, can see the edge of threat in his posture, the way his fingers are lingering just a bit too close to the Senban dipped in his trademark and very nasty poison, a spark of fury well hidden in hazel eyes. Still, he hasn't made a move yet, and that's a decent start. Kotatsu, he says quietly, and the boy who followed them from his office obediently slips up beside him. Go find Guy. Tell him Genma needs him. Yusukagi sama, Kotatsu says quickly, then bows and disappears in a whirl of leaves. Iruzen allows a bit of tension to bleed from his shoulders. Choza might have trained a team of absolute maniacs! But Guy, Ibizu, and Genma are admirably close, and Genma and Guy have a stronger bond than many shinobi. If anyone can help the Tokujo calm down, it's gonna has Green Beast. Well, this is unexpected, he says, allowing his voice to carry. Five sets of eyes immediately snap to him, and Aruzen doesn't allow himself to glare at the flicker of disappointment that crosses Genma's face. A is the priority right now, though Hiruzen will definitely be having a talk with his erstwhile bodyguard later. A, to what does Kanoha owe the pleasure of your presence? He's eyes narrow, and he studies Hiruzen for a moment before shifting his gaze to Rasa. It was both of you that did this, he asks, not quite hostile enough to make it a threat, but more than enough to have Genma tugging the senban from his mouth and straightening abruptly. The two Kunoichi accompanying A shift forward automatically, hands reaching for their weapons, and Raido slides out of the shadows to stand a pace behind Hiruzen, one hand on the hilt of his poisoned sword. That's quite enough of that, Hiruzen decides with a faint sigh. Good mom, he says gentle but firm. I thought your team had left already. Genma doesn't take his eyes off the Kumo Nin, though he does step away and roll the shoulders, sliding back into the deceptively lazy slouch he favors when in front of a threat. Sorry, Hokage-sama, he answers. One of Hana's dogs had a lump, so she wanted to check him over before we left. I said it was fine. Hanahato took our new friend from Suna to get some extra medical supplies, since she said she's a decent medic man. Genma also has the ability to say something in such a way that it could be either an insult or completely serious, and the listener is left wondering. Catching how Rasa is eyeing the Tokujo, Hiruzen allows himself a brief, hard look at the assassin, who gives him a cheerfully innocent smile in return and then says, All right, you're assigned to the northeast. Yes. When Genma nods, he continues, Change course and head for Uzushio Gakure. Scour the ruins for signs of Karama living there, and check with any inhabitants to see if he was there previously or recently returned. I'll be sending the same orders to Kakashi's squad. Genma doesn't ask questions, just inclines his head, then turns at the sound of Guy calling his name. Hiruzen waves him away before he can ask to be dismissed, and the Tokujo bows, steps back, and gives A one last long, cool glance before he heads for his friend. Hiruzen... Absolutely hates his job some days. Most days. Both of us, indeed. He answers A's earlier statement with a polite smile. I take it this isn't a friendly visit, eh? A glares at him, folding his brownie arms over his chest in a way that would be a threat to anyone not considered the third god of shinobi. Hiruzen is faintly amused. He's old, yes, but if this upstart boy half his age thinks to intimidate him, he'll have to do far more than loom a little. It makes him wish he'd grabbed his pipe, because it's hard to look less concerned than he does when he's absolutely smoking it, and little gets his point across better. After a moment of attempting to stare him down, A finally huffs and says sharply, 
We already know you hold the Kirby in Cherokee, but what other did Cherokee are you hiding, Sarah Toby? One brow rising, he and looks up at the big man and glances at Rasa. The Kazakage looks back, equally startled, then inclines his head, ceding control of the conversation to him. Hiruzen stifles on other side and answers, None! But may I ask what gave you the impression that we were? A gives him a distinctly dirty look and jerks a thumb at his brother who looks bored and disinterested at the posturing. B's been talking with the Hachibi and an unfamiliar Beiju recently showed up in the man space they all share. The Hachibi hasn't got a glimpse of him yet, but he says the host chakra is definitely Uzumaki and you got the only ones I know of. Since your new Jinchuriki just killed two of our best Jonin and nabbed a little girl, I thought I'd give you the chance to hand her over before this devolves into a fourth war. Very, very alarmed now, and Rosa takes a step back. Another? He demands and feels Rasa catch his elbow when the ground wavers beneath his feet. Maybe his doctor wasn't exaggerating when she warned him about straining his heart. You're certain there's a tense, bid you? Calculation flickers rapidly across A's face, then slides into grimness. It's not one of yours, he concludes, arms falling from his chest to brace on the white belt he wears. He doesn't look happy with the conclusion. We thought he was one of yours, Rasta says, bitterly amused. He certainly looked like a Kumo Nin when he was kidnapping my son from the center of Suna. And Uzumaki Kushina's son from our streets. Hiruzen adds, slightly brushing off Rasa's hand. He's grateful to the newfound solidarity between their villages, but he's hardly a helpless old man, regardless of shacks rendered. We've come to believe there's a pattern. A clearly doesn't need it spelled out for him. Jen Cherokee, he says grimly. He's stealing Jen Cherokee, and you thought he was one of Mashinori? Perhaps not directly affiliated. Hiruzen allows, though his thoughts are still mostly occupied with the idea that there aren't nine tail beasts, but ten! This has the potential to be very bad indeed! Though we mostly have speculations regarding his past at this point, something your father did maybe, Uzumaki Kurama looks to at least share blood with a Kumo Nin somewhere in his past. With a deep frown, A looks over at B, then blows out a heavy breath. Might be, he allows grudgingly. My father was a good man and a strong Kage. That doesn't mean he didn't keep secrets. Karama would be a hell of a secret to keep perusing things wryly, though perhaps less of one if he fled to Uzushio as a child. Or maybe it wasn't the Rei Kage's project at all. If Orochimaru and Donzo's actions have taught Iruzen anything, it's that a Kage can never entirely control their village, no matter how they wish to. We should speak somewhere more private. Rasa says quietly, tilting his head back in the direction of the administration building. Hiruzen would be annoyed by the presumption, but the thought of Donzo reminds him that not all the ears potentially nearby are guaranteed to be loyal. A good idea. He agrees and inclines his head to A. Welcome to Kanaha, eh? A flicker of reluctant amusement rises in A's eyes before it's tamped down and he snores as he steps through the gates. This place is kind of neat, B says, following close behind, and Amuzan is all too familiar with that kind of, I dare you to stop me, cheer. He bruises himself for anything. The bad the whole village smells like, oh, shut up. A hisses at his brother, currently in a headlock, as if he isn't one of the most powerful shinobi alive. As if both of them aren't. I told you to stop rapping. One more word and it's an iron call for you. Why? Hiruzen wonders a little despondently. Why must the best shinobi always have such colorful personalities? At least Hiruzen's fondness for tastefully erotic literature is both subtle and easily hidden. Unfortunately, he's come to see that he's a definite minority where his quirks are concerned. Yugito isn't entirely certain what she was expecting when Matatabi told her to find a wayward biju trapped in human form. More... inhumanity, perhaps. Anger, fury, destruction, a creature of rage and fire and inhuman hunger tearing his way across the elemental countries without allowing anything to get in his way. 
What she's found instead is a man, tired and tense, with lines around his eyes that are from equal parts good humor and weariness. His hair is like a bacon, brilliantly red, and his eyes are three shades darker, warm like coals in the heart of a fire on a cold night. Between his ragged, unpatched clothing and his bare feet, he looks like the deceptively wise beggar from a story giving lessons to the emperor rather than a construct of chakra given life and intelligence. Up, up, he urges as Yugita watches crouched down next to one of the other small bodies she missed last night. Come on, Kit, it's morning and we've got a long day ahead of us. If you don't get up now, I'm going to jog you in the pod. There's a sleepy grumble, a wordless protest, but the little blonde boy sits up, rubbing at his eyes. Karama chuckles softly, ruffling his hair like Yugito has seen parents do to their children before and drops a handful of granola bars into his lap. Then he moves on to the redhead, curled up next to the blonde, whose eyes are already open, even if he doesn't look entirely happy about it, and one dark hand combs gently through spiky crimson air. All right, Gara, Karama asks and gets a nod as the boy sits up. More granola bars change hands, and Gara immediately tears one open, nibbling at it tiredly. He's gentle, Yugito thinks, pulling his Iori a little more tightly around herself and staying silent. That's something else she hadn't expected at all. Gentle in a way she's never really encountered before. Her teasers are brutal, and their methods are harsh. Kumo is a little friendlier to its Jin Cherokee than any other country she knows, but that doesn't mean it's nice living there. Yugito has been training since she was two years old, and she's never felt human. B is kind, and he's fond of her, but he's also permanently busy, either shadowing the Reikage or training on his own. And A, he believes that Jin Cherokee have no right to anything, not even their own decisions. They're tools for the good of the village, first and foremost. Yukito has been raised to believe that, to know it and hold it dear, to use it to grow stronger. But Matatabi is a constant presence inside of her with a will of her own, and sometimes Yukito can't help but look at her and think, But this isn't what I want. Won't I ever get a choice? Morning already, Karamani. The last body asks, shedding blankets as it sits up to reveal a girl only a little younger than Yugito, with pretty leaf green hair and eyes like a sunset before a storm. Those eyes slip past Garama, instantly alighting on Yugito, and her entire face lights up. Oh, are you another Jin Cherokee? That gets her even more attention, the two little boys jerking out of their sleep faces to blink at her in surprise, and Yugito swallows down her nervousness, a faint flicker of... What if they don't like me? What if I can't be one of them even here? Then squares her shoulders and nods. I'm Nei Yugito, and my bijou is Matatabi, the Navy. Pleased to meet you. I was a monkey Naruto! The blonde boy answers enthusiastically. And I've got the cubie in my head! Fu, so, formerly of Takigakure, the girl offers with a smile. My bijou is Chomei, the Nanabi. I'm glad you're here. It's so cool to meet the others. The red-headed boy glances between his two friends, aquamarine eyes wide and faintly cautious, and then looks at Karama. When Karama just rolls his eyes and scuffs a head through his hair again, the boy flushes, ducks his head, and says quietly, I'm Gara no Sabaku, Wishukaku, the Ichibi. And now that we all know everyone's got a name, let me borrow your hairbrush for a second, Fu. Karama says, rising from his crouch. That throne is probably meant to sound annoying, but there's amusement in his eyes and warmth on his face. Yugito can't bring yourself to even begin to feel offended. Are you actually going to brush your hair? Fu asks interestedly. I can help. It's not for me, Brett. Kirama returns exasperated. He takes the brush she passes him, then sits down in front of the dying fire and beckons Yugito closer. Come here, kitten. Let's see what we could do to get you looking less like a murder scene. For a moment, Yugito thinks about protesting that she's more than capable of doing it herself, that she's always brushed her hair before and never had anyone to help her, but... But she's never had anyone offer to help, and surely it will be okay to accept that sort of kindness just this once. Silently, she slides over, settling in front of Karama's crossed legs and turning her back to him. There's a pause, and then fingers slip through her hair, pulling it back over her shoulders. The feeling of it hanging free is unfamiliar. As long as she can remember, Yugito has kept it tied back out of her way. 
That's simply how a shinobi wears it, and she's never once been anything but a shinobi. Out of the corner of her eye, Yugito can see clever fingers tipped with sharp claws picking determinedly at a knot, and... She doesn't know how to feel about that. The simplest way to deal with all the mud and blood matted into her hair would be to cut it off or just yank the brush through. That's what she would do, what she had planned on in a vague way when she could push down the fear and desperation enough to focus on silly and consequential things like hair. But Karama is taking the time to work each mat apart to free each strand before he gently slides the brush through it, and that's also unfamiliar. Alarmingly so. Matatami? she asks, because that's who she always asks, and has ever since they first came to an understanding. Deep within her mind, there's a soft chuckle, a warm touch like the brush of fur against her cheek. Don't let the grumpiness fool you. Karama has a soft heart under all the bluster. He used to hide it better, but I think he stopped trying now. Yukito is glad. She pulls the haori a little more closely around her, not for the warmth so much as the scent of fire and sky-clean wind caught in the fabric, and closes her eyes against the dental tugs of the brush through her long hair. Do you want me to leave it loose, kitten? Karama asks, and Matatabi is the only one who's ever called her that, but she doesn't mind it coming from this man. I can braid it if you want. Think I remember how to do that at least. For a moment, Yugito debates letting it fall free, but she's still a shinobi, even if she's currently abandoned her village. She could have run to Kumo, after all. It was far closer to the Valley of Clouds and Lightning than Kurama was. But Matatabi had spoken of others like her, children like her, and she hadn't been able to resist. A boy joy is probably unlikely the wrong one, her teachers would say. Her teachers are dead, though, slaughtered without hesitation or mercy when the shinobi with the purple eyes came for her. Yukito wasn't fond of them, could even say she hated them, but she hardly wanted them dead. Matatabi said that people were hunting the Jinchuriki, hunting Karama and the children he had saved from loneliness, unhappiness, abuse. And Yukito had looked towards Kumo Kakare, had hesitated even with that fearsome chakra seething behind her, and turned away. Because there was a chance, if she went to Kurama, that he could save her. There was a chance that she could save him, or at the very least help him. Yukito isn't fooling herself when she thinks she's a talented Kunoichi. After all, she's never had a chance to be anything else. Finding Kurama was her own decision, the first she's ever really made. And if being a good shinobi will help him, she'll keep doing it. But this time, instead of it being for someone else, it will be for her. Because she wants to. Because she chooses to. She likes that idea the same way she liked Karama's words about family. She doesn't know her family, not really. She's A's cousin, but it's a distant relation at best, unacknowledged beyond making her eligible to be a Jinchuriki. Matatabi is more of a mother to her than the woman she's seen pictures of but never met. And the other children here call Karama Karama Ni, like he's their brother. Yugito has seen how A and B are together, and she thinks she might want that too. Write it, she says, quiet but firm. It keeps in my way otherwise. Those claw-tipped fingers brush her cheek dental despite the danger inherent in their edges. It's pretty, Karama says as he gathers the strands up in his hands, like sunlight on sand. Yugito ducks down a little, adding the flush on her cheeks in Karama's Sayori. No one's ever said that about her hair before? No one's ever said that about her before. Maybe it really was the wrong choice finding Karama instead of returning to Kumo. Still, Yugito finds that she doesn't regret it at all.